everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this exciting talk. My name is Kanar. I'm a fourth year here at the Institute. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Liv Nielsen Stutz. Liv Stutz is visiting us from the Department of Anthropology from the, at Emory University. Professor Stutz works on mortuary archaeology with interest in the implementation of social theory, especially practice theory, body theory, and ritual theory. Her study on mortuary practices in Mesolithic Southern Scandinavia was published as a book titled Embodied Rituals and Ritualized Bodies. Most recently, she has co-edited the Oxford Handbook for Archaeology of Dead and Burial, and she is also one of the, co one of the editors for Archaeological Dialogues. She has numerous published articles on ethics and archaeology, cultural heritage politics, and identity politics, especially as manifested in the repatriation debate. Earlier today, we had a very interesting discussion session um, with her on similar issues. Professor Stutz is also involved in field projects in Latvia and Jordan. But today she will be presenting us about her research on Mesolithic and Neolithic European mortuary practices in her talk titled Archaeothanatology, a Taphonomy of Ritual Practice, Reconstructing, Reconstructing Mortuary Practices from Archaeological Sources. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stutz. Thank you so much, Pinar, and thank you so much for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, any questions and comments that you might have after, after the talk. How can archaeology study and understand the experience of death and the rituals responding to it in the past? Typically, we have few and fragmented, if any, uh, written accounts that would allow us this kind of access. So in this talk, I will elaborate on the methods and the theoretical frameworks that I have used to explore this dimension of human experience in the past, and uh, how this, uh, these theoretical frameworks and methodological approaches can be successfully, I believe, articulated. So the title of this presentation, uh, Bringing Taphonomy and Ritual Practice Together, reflects this ambition. <clears throat> In archaeology, we need a theoretical framework that allows us to reflect on social and ritual dynamics on a general scale, and that can be articulated with the nature of our sources. These theories will, to some extent, take their departure in the universal experience of death, while recognizing at the same time that these experiences will always be deeply culturally situated. The departure here is that the universal experience of death is a, a fundamental a component of, of this and uh, the encounter of the human cadaver. While we know that these are widely variable uh, across cultures, um, all societies deal with death to, in some way and the response tends to be ritual and is often uh, involving the handling of the dead body. In fact, the remains of the handling of the dead body is how we as archaeologists tend to ultimately identify a feature as a mortuary feature whether that's correct or not, but that's kind of like our departure. So I will start by outlining some of the theoretical foundations and then I will move into uh, showing how this theoretical framework can be articulated with the methodological approach called archaeotanatology that I will uh, introduce to you. And finally, I will show how I have applied this theory me method package to burials from Mesolithic and Neolithic Northern Europe. When a person dies, the survivors are left not only with the abstract problem of loss and grief, but also with a concrete product of death, a human cadaver. While archaeology traditionally has tended to overlook this last aspect, I want to emphasize that the ways in which the dead body is handled in mortuary ritual is linked to central cultural concerns and structures tied to attitudes toward the body, the self and other, dead and living, culture and nature, order and disorder, the future and the past, etc. All potentially crucial dimensions of human life. In order to define the human cadaver and understand it in a ritual context, I have been inspired by Julia Christeva's abject theory and Victor Turner's concept of liminality and anti-structure. Their respective models can be successfully combined in a discussion of the encounter with the cadaver and the process of dealing with and redefining it through ritual practice. At death, the system of the mindful body and the embodied mind breaks down and the body is no longer subject, uh, no longer a subject engaged 
in dialectic in the dialectic of structured and structuring practices that simultaneously reproduce social order and embody it to the point of affecting how people think and feel and here I'm, I'm obviously drawing uh, closely on uh, Pierre Bourdieu's practice theory but also the ritual uh, theory framework by uh, Catherine Bell. Death transforms the body, uh, it's radically transformed. It resembles the person but it is no longer that person. It's becoming engaged in irreversible, dynamic and radically transformative processes of decay that will challenge the social order of what a body looks like when alive. Cultural social control and discipline can no longer be imposed from within, but need to be imposed by others. And while the body is different, it doesn't immediately acquire an object status. It's situated somewhere in between subject and object, uh, in between categories. And in this sense, it has become an ab abject in the sense defined by Kisteva. The fe this phenomenological category uh, that kind of is situated between subject and object denotes something that is in between, something that is often repulsive and low. And we recognize Mary Douglas's uh, definition of dirt as matter out of place, or Victor Turner's polluting uh, category of neophytes that are no longer not yet classified um, as they are uh, transitioning in rites of passage. And here the lack of uh, clear separation between the living individual and the corpse, between life and death, between desire and repulsion, makes the cadaver the quote-unquote ultimate abject, and those are Christopher's words. It is not the absence of purity that defines the abject. In short, it's not because some people may think that cadavers are polluting or, or disgusting or dirty. Uh, it is the fact that they transgress important cultural categories that make them uh, abject. So the cadaver, through its very situatedness between categories, threatens the order of things. Something must be done about this, and ritual practice is the response to this crisis. Again, we recognize the connection to Victor Turner's anti-structure, building on the tripartite system of ritual structure defined by von Gennep. The mortuary rituals falls comfortably into categories of separation, anti-structure, uh, and uh, reintegration. Although, of course, how these look across cultures may vary uh, incredibly, as you know. Mortuary ritual can be viewed as an ultimate rite of passage, where the liminal period overlaps with the process of redefining the abject cadaver into an object from which the mourners can separate and thereby also complete the transition into death. Since cultural order is no longer has a place within the dead body, it is imposed upon it by others who produce an acceptable good death. As in the case of our mortuary practices, somebody else will need to dress and comb and prepare the body to stage it in a way that makes it look <coughs> like it is uh, resting or sleeping in ways that conform to how we conceptualize uh, what death might be to us. So through ritual practice, the deceased is redefined. Like other rites of passages, uh, this one too tends to resonate with social concerns and generate structures of order as they are embedded in other structuring structures. So in short, the way the dead body is handled practically, and I stress practically, is intimately linked to central concerns in a society. If we can focus in on these practices, we will be able to get closer, not only to the phenomenological uh, reading of past experience, but also glimpse some of the central social and cultural structures and concerns. And this theoretical framework that draws on Bell's practice theory-based ritual theory emphasizes the process of the embodied experience, the embodied knowledge, and the practical engagement in ritual, rather than ascribed meaning. And so if we look at Catherine Bell's uh, understanding of ritual. Uh, she will stress that uh, following practice theory, practice and structure are part of the same dialectical or dialectic process and that ritual practice through the through ritualization, through practical engagement in ritual, um, the practitioners generate a, uh, a or create a world or a structure of belief systems and categorizations. It's the bodily action 
and not the meaning given that is central. It is the, the embodied knowledge of how to do things that is the central or point of departure for this way of understanding ritual. So if we look at this picture here of two men engaged in Muslim prayer, they will carry out a set of prescribed practices with their bodies. Uh, and we may ask them why they do things and how they, wh why, what does it mean? And they could give us generic or even different answers about why they do it and what it means. Uh, Catherine Bell's uh, understanding of this is that even if it would be contradictory or very generic, that doesn't really matter because the most important uh, component of this is the, engage the practical engagement in the ritual. And through this practical engagement, um, belief and uh, buy-in, if you want, into the social structures is, are created. So the meaning can potentially vary, but the embodied knowledge is shared. And the embodied knowledge, uh, being uh, not uh, necessarily verbalized, uh, is also even more powerful in stru structuring uh, uh, the participant's world. So if we want to do an archaeology of ritual practice, we must study material practices. And I, I believe that this is where I feel like if we have a theoretical toolbox that focuses on practice and what people in the past were doing rather than taking a departure in what they might have been thinking about it, uh, that is, that's, that's fortunate for archaeology because what archaeology does is to study materialized practices, to study traces of what people were doing in the past. But if we want to do this, we also need to visualize the actions in the past and use that as, a, a, as our in, if you want. So if we look, for example, at the practice illustrated here, of, on a Holocaust memorial site of placing stones on top of a, um, a funerary monument within the Jewish uh, faith and culture. Uh, we could archaeologically collect these stones, we could measure them, we could look at their provenience, we could weigh them, we could describe them and so on. But if we miss the uh, importance of the act of placing them there, we kind of miss the point. If you ask practicing Jews what it means to put the stones on top of a funerary monument, you get very different answers to your question. And the most common one is, it's something that we do, it's part of our culture. So that again illustrates to us that the meaning of why it's done is not as important in this case as the practice of doing it and, and, and the participation in a cultural practice that uh, uh, creates a sense of, of belonging and reproduction of cultural tradition for, for a group of people. And if we want to do this, if we want to visualize actions in the past and look at acts and, and not uh, just artifacts, we need methods that allow this connection. Uh, and one such method is, in my opinion, archaeotanatology that I will move on to in, uh, in a minute. Uh, but before we do so, I want to also stress that when we look at practice, new questions and new perspectives emerge. Because looking for practice means looking for a lot of unrepetitive, ref repetitive and unreflective actions. The embodied knowledge, the things that people do on a, in a repeated way. In mortuary archaeology, it's quite common to focus, at least in my period, on the burials that stand out or that are exceptionally rich or are, 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 are interesting because of their unique uh, character. But if we want to take this uh, theoretical approach really seriously, we, think, we should, I think, really focus in on also highlighting the importance of the, 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 the banal, if you want, because that has a lot of of, of interest and value. The norm for how people b are buried and not buried becomes the focus because it is part of the structure. So how do we take this theoretical package and connect it to the archaeological field situation and the archaeological sources? One way of doing that is uh, archaeotanatology. Archaeotanatology 
was initially called Anthropologie de Terrain when it was conceived in France in the 1970s as a kind of cross-disciplinary field approach to burials that combines uh, detailed observations in the field with knowledge about how the human body decomposes after death. Um, and the aim, it kind of, it really ties into the concept of the chaîne opératoire in French archaeology, the aim is to isolate the effects of natural processes like putrefaction, decomposition, erosion, bioturbation, etc., in order to reconstruct the funerary treatment of a dead body, meaning everything that happens to the body from the moment of death to the moment of excavation, which can involve a lot of things that are both intentional, unintentional, culturally significant, or just taphonomic. You may be familiar with archaeotanatology uh, to some extent, but I'm still going to run through some of the basic principles to, uh, to introduce the, the methodology. Uh, a couple of the, one of the basic principles that we recognize from also traditional burial archaeology is to pay attention to the relative chronology of the articulations. Some articulations are very light label and will uh, disarticulate early in the year. Uh, breakdown process of the body, like phalanges, cervical vertebra, mandibular uh, articulation, and so on. Others are stable and more persistent, like tarsal, lumbar vertebra, and so on. And, and these are often linked to bi biomechanical charges, uh, etc. We use these to both establish the nature of the burial. Was the body buried intact? What sometimes it's used to Used to, we used to call primary burial, or is the uh, dep deposit that we are looking at now uh, one uh, in a series of consecutive in engagements with, with, the, um, with the body. Uh, but we can also use them to establish details about decomposition processes in the grave feature if we have interaction with the, with the decomposing body, if we have uh, manipulation of the body during decomposition. Uh, the, uh, chronology of the um, uh, articulations can help us uh, establish uh, an internal timeline. How, how decomposed was this body when uh, it was uh, when the burial was interfered with? The more original contribution by archaeotanatology is to consider the dynamic of creation and filling of what's called empty volumes or espace vide um, as soft tissues in the body disappear. Uh, the bones will become disarticulated eventually, but they will also sometimes have a little bit of a range of movement in which they can move under the influence of gravity. And all bones move to some extent. Uh, and as, as you have a decomposing body <coughs> where the bones are going to move to some extent and then you'll have often sediment penetrating in and uh, stabilizing the bones in one position, you can use these movements of the bones to infer a lot of details about the immediate uh, environment uh, in which the body was buried. For example, if it was buried in a, in, a, in a coffin that has left no other archaeological traces, or if it was wrapped in something, or, or so on and so forth, or if, it, if there was um, organic material close to the body that decomposed and left a space into which some bones might move. We make a key distinction between so-called empty volumes inside of and outside uh, of the initial volume of the cadaver, uh, meaning that you have these empty spaces that are created through decomposition of soft tissue, but you can also have empty spaces that are created by the fact that the body is buried in, say, a coffin. In the, in the cases of filled volumes of decomposition, all movements affected by bones have taken place within the initial volume of the cadaver, and in this case we have a Neolithic burial from southern France, where on top of it being surrounded by sediment, it was also surrounded by sediment that's very fluid, and so the penetration was immediate, and the grave, uh, the grave was filled with sediment, and as the soft tissues of the body decomposed, uh, it was replaced almost immediately by penetrating sediment. So these bones have moved very little. But we can also have open volumes of decomposition, like this case here, 
where we have significant movement of bones outside of the initial volume of the cadaver, even if it's, it's, basically, it's basically keeping its um, uh, shape. Uh, we can see that especially around the, the cranium a lot of things have happened. Uh, we see how the patella are dislocated here and uh, the, uh, the rotation away from the disarticulation between the cranium and the cervical vertebra, the movement of the cranium and the uh, projection of the mandible that you can see up there lying uh, at the very top uh, have been interpreted as the effect of a, the decomposition of something that was placed behind the, um, the body or the, the skull at the time of, uh, of a deposition that would have, when it decomposed, completely um, uh, kind of created this kind of movement. We can also use this to trace coffins and this is, has been really successful in France because uh, as the method was developed in the 1970s, it kind of immediately was implemented in these large scale medieval, urban medieval cemetery excavations where over and over again, they were able to make these kinds of observations about how a coffin uh, that kind of empty space affects the body, and here is a, a good example of that. An open volume can be established by the observation of the pelvis, the femora, the patella, and, and the skull in this case. So if we look here, we have the dislocation of the pubic symphysis, which if you have the pelvis like this, in an open space of decomposition, it can fall laterally like this, and thereby um, the pubic symphysis becomes dislocated. Um, while it, when that happens, the femora will rotate slightly outward and the patella will fall to the lateral sides of the knees. Uh, it does not involve any rotation of the, of the rest of the lower limbs in general. And in this case, we also have a, a rotation, a post depositional uh, rotation of, of the skull. And, uh, that can be determined by looking at the rotation of the cervical vertebra. If it's, if it's uh, regular and uh, progressive, uh, it, it happened when there were still tendons and muscles attached to the a neck or to the, the cervical vertebra. But if, if all of the rotation is between the second and third vertebra, it, happens as a, uh, it, it kind of happens as a snap during the process of decomposition. In this case, we see a lowering of the mandible and a rotation. Uh, post depositional rotation of the skull. And then we also have this bilateral pressure, sometimes called alignment across the side, but on this, along the sides of this uh, child here. And in this case, we also have the support of archaeological observations of decomposed wood on the side. So all these things come together to, to show us that this body was placed inside of a coffin. And uh, this also allows us to see this when there is no other archaeological evidence that is, that is present. We have these diagnostic criteria that help us. And we can have this kind of alignment, or in French, uh, effet de parois, maintaining skeletal elements in precariously balanced positions uh, that indicate that there was something there that held the, the bones in place until penetrating sediment uh, came in and, and supported it, and in this case, we can follow it around the body of this individual here. It can be used to infer the limits of the gray feature. This could simply be that the body is kind of pushed up against the side of, of a burial, but it can also be used to identify the presence of objects and structures within the feature um, that has affected the decomposition of the body. So, Having just briefly introduced the way our archaeotanatology works, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how I tried to use this in combination with the focus of practice, uh, looking at how did, how did um, people handle their debt uh, practically. And my case study is the Mesolithic cemeteries around the Baltic, I'm going to show you three today. Vedbeck Bergebacken uh, with uh, 22 individuals in a prehistoric fjord landscape on the East Danish coast. 
uh, the site was discovered in 1975. It was one of the first really well-preserved Mesolithic cemeteries that was discovered in Northern Europe that was published not in Russian. And so it made a huge uh, impact on uh, what we believe about the Mesolithic. Some of the burials like this one, here we have a triple burial with two adults and a child placed in between. Uh, we have these uh, kind of iconic burials of uh, people placed uh, on top of uh, uh, on top of, of deer antler. And then we have uh, the Skotteholm complex in southern Sweden, which is uh, a series of sites. Uh, the oldest site, Skotteholm II, contains two individuals, and it's followed without an, uh, a, a clear time gap by uh, Skotteholm I with 63 individuals. And we understand the chronology of these sites quite well because uh, they were uh, established on low-lying islands in this brackish lagoon, and uh, what, as the water uh, levels were rising uh, during this uh, part of, um, of Hol the Holocene landscape, the, the Baltic uh, Sea rose consistently and uh, the first site was submerged and so they moved to the second one and then that site was submerged and they moved we think inland to a site that was kind of identified by gravel ex during gravel extraction in the 1930s but never excavated so we have a nice uh, here we have actually a quite nice control of the of the chronological development on the site and here we have a couple of examples of of burials. Here again we see these primary, nice primary burials. Up there you see a, a dog burial with an ornate antler axe. And uh, here is another example of a young man buried with a four-year-old child in his arms, uh, which is a quite beautiful example of, of these burials. And then finally, uh, in the end, I will take you to Sveinjeki, which is a large site in northern Latvia. And you can see that the time span there is considerably longer. It's a cemetery with 330 individuals in counting. It's not fully excavated yet. Uh, it is also on a kind of gravel ridge uh, in a prehistoric lake landscape. So this is an inland site. Uh, and uh, here are some images from the excavations in the 1960s and 70s. And I will show you photographs later of what the excavations from a couple of years ago uh, look like. So when I, was, when I started to look at these, so to understand, I think, the history or the focus of, of my work, uh, I think it's, it's, it's useful to, to look at how these burials were perceived by Mesolithic archaeology. So as I said, they were like these first, they made a huge impact in the 1970s and, and early 80s, <coughs> uh, kind of giving Mesolith the Mesolithic all of a sudden like a human face. Uh, up until then, I think uh, Richard Bradley used to say that uh, Mesolithic people have social relations with hazelnuts, and that's to some extent true. All of the focus was really on like, uh, economy and hunting and gathering strategies and those kinds of things and uh, all of a sudden we have all of these ritual features mortuary practices and 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 well preserved showing just an incredible variation as you can see your sitting burial uh, people lying on the back on the side on the stomach and so on and so forth so a lot of the focus came to be called oh they have such complex mortuary practices because there's a lot of variation. But that was also immediately tied into the idea of complex societies, that these, that these sites were uh, kind of falling nicely into a kind of processual archaeological story uh, of uh, complex hunter-gatherers on the cusp of the Neolithic. So a lot of the focus was always on like how are these uh, burials different from one another. And I wanted to kind of just kind of pull that back and say, okay, there is a lot of variation, but there is also a lot of things that seem to be non-negotiable. And the things that seem to be non-negotiable must be the things that are most important for the people that are burying their dead here. 
what are they not changing in all of this variability? And that's what I call the normative variable. In all of this variation, what do we find? Well, we find a lot of primary burial. We have a sitting, sitting individual here, amazing, we maintained primary, or sorry, um, uh, label articulations. Uh, the same thing over here with one sitting and one lying individual. And you can also see that they were clearly filled in burials, otherwise these sitting individuals would have collapsed. So uh, there are clearly certain things that are, that are really important and uh, that is kind of recurring. And that's not to deny the variability, it's just to say like, what, what, what must have been most important for these people? And you see here a range of what we can see. This is the only individual that's lying on the stomach. It also has projectile points directed down into the fill, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, we have individuals on the lateral side and on the back. And on the back with the limb saying extension is the most common position. There was a lot of talk about whether or not they use coffins and canoes and things like that. The best candidate for that is this burial here. And when we apply archaeotanatology, we find traces of decomposed wood around the body. We find alignment. So all of that is what led archaeologists initially to say that this is a, definitely a coffin burial. But it's not a body that has decomposed in an empty space. We have maintenance of the pubic symphysis. We have the patella neatly in place. And up here, we have this nice little package of artifacts. Uh, where these uh, the axe and the kind of like stone plaques are lined up on the on this uh, in this like precariously balanced position, all of which indicate that they are held in place by penetrating sediment. So in this case, probably the decomposed wood comes from some kind of other form of maybe soft-containing wrapping of bark, for example, that we know from some Mesolithic sites and. Uh, perhaps just like the individual was wrapped, so perhaps probably was also this package of artifacts that is held neatly together, probably tied up just like the individual and placed inside of the of a pit that was later filled in with sediment. Burial eight in Vedbekbergebakken on the the Danish site uh, is probably for Mesolithic archaeologists. This is probably the most one of the most, one of the really famous burials that we have. It's an adult female who is richly adored, adorned with beans. She has small stones placed under her wrists and her ankles, um, and her, like you can see it here, under her feet as well. Most dramatically, she has a newborn child on her side, and under the newborn child is the ulna of a swan. So the interpretation is that this child was placed on the swan swing. And it is one of those iconic Mesolithic images that made this period very emotionally uh, available, if you want. But what few have noticed is how strangely this body has decomposed. And I don't blame them. The, the rest of the, the other story is more interesting in some ways. But we can still see here that we have a really strange combination of open and filled spaces. We have the opening of the pubic symphysis here. And we have this really unusual pattern of a decomposition of a Jurassic cage. Usually what happens is that the interior parts of the, of the ribs falls toward the medial axis of the body and down. And here what has happened is that it has opened up like this, which is strange. Uh, and at the same time, it's not the, the articulations are so beautifully preserved on this part of the body that are lying on top of small stones, or like elevated inside of the feature. So some things seem to be, there seem to be open volumes and, and fill in volumes at the same time. So one interpretation here is that perhaps the, not just the child was placed on top of something, swan's wing, but also the adult was placed on top of something, maybe a beam structure that would have impacted the um, vertebral column in places where it, uh, it created enough pressure to uh, allow the, 
the ribs to kind of like fall back into some kind of void created behind the upper part of the body. Um, we have some practices like this in Scotland, in Vietbeck, where you have here, uh, in this case, we have anther placed behind the body. Perhaps they were used to carry the individual or lowering the individual. And here we have a much, a pretty disturbed burial, but where nevertheless we can imagine that if this nicely articulated uh, forearm here would have been in contact with this uh, humerus here, they would have to kind of be brought in contact with each other higher up. Uh, and then about wrappings, we have some really nice cases. Grave 22 has this nice alignment around the body with bilateral pressure uh, pushing the upper part of the body toward the center, toward the medial axis. And most importantly, here we have a vertical, uh, vertical clavicle, which indicates that the shoulder was projected upward and forward. And we have a similar and, and we know in this case that this pressure was not exercised by the feature itself because to fit the antlers it would have needed to be much wider. So we must have had a wrapped up body in this feature. And perhaps this one as well that I showed you earlier is an example of some kind of soft container. But here we don't actually have a good uh, understanding of exactly where the limits of the feature are. But this is the only case of really clear sample of wrapping of an individual in southern Scandinavia, I would say that's this clear. It's different in Latvia. So, um, these were a couple of the kinds of results that the archaeotanatological analysis reveals. But what does that mean, besides the fact that we got slightly better quality information about what they did with their dead? How can we bring it into contact with how they treated the body and what that might mean. So if we break it down, the bodies were interred as primary burials. There are a few exceptions, actually. There are a couple of cremations. Um, the burial pit was immediately filled, and the bodies were placed on the back sitting or on the side of the limbs flexed. Occasionally, they were wrapped or placed on platforms. Sometimes they seem to have been kind of like cushioned or shielded from immediate contact with the sediment and artifacts and ochre placed with the dead. Most importantly, I have argued that they were buried in a way that respected the integrity of the body and possibly the individual after death. The natural process of decomposition were hidden. The death, the good death was performed in a way where the, body, where the dead still resembled a living person and sometimes the bodies were even arranged to relate to each other in living ways, like holding each other, or when there is double grave, sometimes they were looking at each other. So we have a kind of staging of, of death where um, the individual still looks, looks uh, like a, a, a person. This is in big contrast with what we, uh, with what we as archaeologists know is coming next, which is the collective burial practices of the Neolithic and the same area where bodies are fragmented, uh, manipulated, uh, moved around, and uh, turned into kind of like these collective mortuary practices of the, of the big um, uh, dolmen. But, What's also really interesting is to look at these norms and then look at the exception. Um, and I think that in the exceptions become really interesting when we have thought more deeply about what is usually non-negotiable, what is usually a good, decent uh, funeral. There are a couple of manipulations, uh, cases of manipulations of the body. So while the decomposition process was avoided in the great majority of cases where burials were not disturbed uh, as a general rule on these sites. There are, there are, of course, they knew what happens to, death, to bodies when they decompose. They were hunters and gatherers. They would know and they would be quite used to manipulating and, and dealing with, with, with dead bodies of animals. And they clearly knew 
uh, what uh, the decomposition do to their bodies to the point of exploiting it. So in this case, again, we have an individual that's buried in a failed space. We see the amazing uh, lack of movement that would indicate any type of open space. Uh, and of course, you see that this is a primary burial, but it's missing some important parts. Uh, and uh, it's been clearly established during the excavation that there is no burrow there. There is no uh, surface disturbance there. It's really, it really seems like these uh, bones have been uh, extracted. And uh, extracted at a, a point in time when not just able articulations like the ones of the carp were um, dislocated, but also really persistent ones like the ones of the knee. So in this case, we have an intervention into a burial uh, that was buried as an entire individual with the removal of bones. And the conclusion here is that the body was buried in a filled pit, but the feature must have been prepared in such a way that would allow this kind of intervention at a late stage of decomposition. Perhaps it was covered with a hide or something that could be uh, uh, kind of lifted up to expose the body for the retrieval of these bones. And then we can also ask ourselves if death was produced in a way where the body was intact and uh, unviolated if you want and where the last thing that you saw of your dead relatives was them looking like pretty much staged like they were alive and even kind of uh, cushioned and all related to each other what would these bones then do and represent was um, the transition from the subject through the abject period of the dead body uh, were, were, were the, the bones at this stage um, uh, products of a finished uh, transition into an object status and did they then become representative of, of uh, the dead or death or ancestors or, or something like that? We, we can ask ourselves those questions. We have another strange burial, an incomplete and partially disarticulated skeleton. Um, one in intact and an articulated hand and then one articulated foot and the rest is kind of a mess. There hasn't been any study of the uh, cut marks because the bone is really poorly preserved. But there is a projectile point in the grave <coughs> in lodged in one of the bones. Here we can ask ourselves, is this individual buried in a way that is completely flipping the normative Practices are they treating this burial, or this body, in a way that is uh, the opposite of the intact, uh, intact living individual? They're partitioning uh, him, or is he buried as close to the norm as possible because of the way that he uh, maybe died? We we can we can play with these kinds of categories. And before uh, I. The final station on this little trip is Sveiniki in northern Latvia. So, so uh, for, this, for the southern Scandinavian Mesolithic burials, things look uh, systematically uh, like this. And when I first started to study Sveiniki, I had the same impression of Sveiniki. It was also like well, the documentation showed really nice primary burials, rich material. Uh, it was. It looked very similar, but when we went back to excavate, we realized that uh, the the reality of the site was probably uh, quite different. So here we have a drawing of the excavation. So you see this kind of drumlin that is uh, um, forming this uh, peninsula in a in a in a lake landscape. And the black trenches are sediment sites, and the trenches on top of the drumlin are uh, various trenches from the, the cemetery area. And when we went back to this, and this was excavated in the 60s and 70s, and we went back to this area here where you see this little square where we, that hadn't been excavated in the 60s and 70s because there is this house 
standing on top of there. And this is Latvia, so it was very difficult to identify <coughs> the owner of this house. It used to be part of some kind of part of a coal shows or something, and it was very, very complicated ownership. And it took a long while for us to identify the owner and get permission to excavate around the foundations of the house and partially inside of them. And this is at the middle of what in Latvia is called the Middle Neolithic, which is really hunter-gatherers with ceramics. So they are contemporary pretty much with what we saw in southern Scandinavia, but they call them uh, Neolithic. And at the beginning, we saw similar things, primary burials, um, triple, or this is actually uh, three adults and one child. And you can see here, I left the, I left the, the, left the image where you can see the foundation of the house that kind of like cut across this burial here. And it was never finished. The excavation was never finished because it was looted, unfortunately. Um, but here is a finished excavation picture, and this is something that we came to see as typical for Spain. And what I think was not necessarily re revealed in all of the, either it's a, it's, it's a Middle Neolithic phenomenon in this part of the cemetery, or these like disturbed burial features were not as systematically recorded at the, during the, the older excavations. We have successive deposition and partial destructions of older graves all the time. The South Scandinavian idea of like not like burying people once and for all and then not coming back and disturbing them is completely different from what we see here at Sainiki, where we have an individual that's buried and you see how well preserved they are. This is uh, so there is no there is no way that they care like that they dug through this burial and didn't see that they were cutting through old burials. And this is pretty typical. We have burials that have cut through four or five older burials and the filling is full of human bones. Here are some examples of that. Uh, an articulated arm, articulated cervical vertebra, probably with a redeposition of a cranium that was found in one, when they were digging through one of these areas and then deposited in another place. So we have this kind of thing over and over again. And uh, again, this is a partial picture because this burial continued in under the house and we didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't understand that when we started to excavate it and we needed to get permission to excavate under the house to get the lower part of them out of which we eventually did. So that's why this is a partial. But we have a, this double burial is really interesting in this case because we have the systematic destruction of older burials, but then just like we had tensions in the southern Scandinavian uh, attitude to the death and the way in which death was constructed, where we saw that people came in and exploited the process of decomposition, there seems to be a similar tension here. So while on the one hand we have consistent uh, disturbance, this burial here was deep. It was uh, considerably deeper than the other ones. It had a big marker or a big stone that doesn't occur naturally on the site, sitting at the top, and it contained two individuals. Uh, this woman here had a belt of uh, amber pieces, of over 100 amber pieces across her pelvic area, and you can see some amber rings in her <coughs> here under her, uh, behind her mandible. And the young male to her side was clearly wrapped at the time of burial and um, his, you see that the, that the um, uh, earth here is really red, it was full of ochre and especially covering the face was a really clay rich kind of ochre sediment that we have interpreted as a, as a mask at the time of burial and we have examples of that from the older excavations here where we have at least amber rings placed in front of the eyes or in this case sunk into the orbits of, of, the, of the dead. And so here we have an exceptional rich burial, very deep, dug through five or six older burials, marked 
So perhaps even if they were kind of fine with digging through older burials, that they were still in this case taking some precautions for that it didn't happen here. Our interpretation here has been to, to, uh, to think through the fact that perhaps this transition from subject to uh, object or from a living person to ancestor happened in a different fashion that you went from uh, that maybe already at the time of disposal in this case with the wrapping and the mask in front of the face uh, the individual was already kind of distinguished from the living and thus took on a different and, and therefore um, the placing of these individuals in, in the earth here meant something different, meant becoming part of this place rather than uh, maintaining their uh, integrity. So at Sveniaki, it seems like new concerns eventually replaced the old. The concerns for the integrity of the body was replaced by a concern for becoming part of uh, this particular place uh, and uh, the past, to be embodied with the ancestors or this mythical uh, mythical place potentially. So it's a, diff it's a kind of a different form of collective burial here and that we kind of see emerging in the Neolithic uh, uh, megalith practices later. And I believe that the comparison between these two regions allow us to reflect over the dynamics and trajectories of cultural change. And when we look at this hunter-gatherer world and the different ways in which it encounters the Neolithic, uh, perhaps the mm -hmm. southern Scandinavian sphere was uh, influenced by the megalithic kind of Atlantic concepts of uh, manipulating human bones and carrying them around and redepositing them while the uh, influences from uh, the east were more potentially more that like might have been some trajectories that we also see in the ceramic traditions throughout Russia and uh, the eastern Baltic uh, creating different spheres and different concerns over uh, a period of time. And I'm going to leave the last 10 or so minutes for questions. I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. is that burials were treated mainly in inventories. They would say a skeleton found mm -hmm. and maybe it was flexed and extended or disarticulated or whatever, gender, age, estimates, and so forth. Fortunately for you, um, most were photographed. But my question is to what extent in this day and age of archaeology are people paying attention to the aspects of burial that are so critical to your analyses, or whether you just yeah. simply go and look at other people's photographs and try it to really, extrapolate. It really depends. The best, <clears throat> the best thing is if you can excavate it yourself, which we did at Sveniaki. But the South Scandinavian examples, I worked with old documentation. And you can do that to some extent, but of course you're not going to be able, what's not been documented, you're not going to be able to look at. Um, the French have really, I think, transformed mortuary archaeology, where uh, archaeotomatology has become the norm for how they excavate burials and where they bring people who are uh, bioarchaeologists or archaeotomatologists to sites with human remains to be in charge of the excavation. And that kind of obviously kind of like challenges who, who is in charge, right? But if but what they have settled on is if it's, if it's a site with burials, it should be a burial specialist that's, that's, that's doing the work. Um, uh, in, uh, other, in other excavations, it really, really varies. I think that there is still a conception of osteology being a uh, handmaiden to archaeology in this case, and so uh, that tends to continue to be the case. But I also see that archaeotanatology is making its way out of French archaeology at the moment and gaining a momentum here in the US and, and, and throughout the uh, English-speaking archaeology anyway. 
So I think uh, slowly but surely, and then you st can still have like amazing documentation where you can still get a lot of information even if you didn't necessarily uh, measure the level of every bone separately and uh, uh, documented its uh, side of appearance, which is what archaeotomatologists do. Uh, but I also want to say that because of the way that it was implemented in rescue work already in the 1970s, they kind of pretty quickly uh, found ways to make it uh, not uh, excruciatingly <coughs> slow. Again? Thank you so much, Lucia. It's um, really interesting, and, and that first image that you have of the, the, the wax yes. decomposing body is going to haunt me all night. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Nightmare>. <laughs> But so, be grateful that I used uh, that I that I used wax models. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so um, <coughs> with your 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 Latvian side, which yeah. I will not even try and yeah. pronounce. Yeah. Um, you have the, this different case in which you know the, there's intrusion into older yeah. areas. Yeah. Um, and what I'm, what I'm wondering is, in how, do, how do we bring that back to the question of ritual that you, you yeah. opened this up with? Um, so is, are you seeing that as, uh, I mean, because on one hand, right, not all mortuary practice has to be ritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, not necessarily. Right? Um, so is it, is it one, it, kind of on a practical question, is the site just so limited that you know there's just not enough space for all the potential burials over this long period, because this is a longer period of the site? No, yeah. Um, and then second, is there a sense in which these intrusive burials have lost a sensitivity towards the potential ritual nature of the, the older burials that they've you know, disconnected to? Um, or is that, yeah. is it, do you see? I see your, I understand your question. Okay. So, uh, first of all, no, because there are concentrations of burials and they could have put them in other places. Second of all, I don't think that it is, uh, so there are different ways of thinking like, ooh, either like did they mess up? Like did they, ooh, did they forgot over and over again that somebody was buried there? I don't think so. I think that this engagement with the past became uh, uh, embedded into uh, what a burial was. That as you uh, dug in this area, you would incorporate your dead with the previous dead. I don't think that it was, well, this is obviously speculation. I don't think that it was because they didn't care I think it was because they really cared, but in a different way. It was no longer as important to not disturb burials as it was to be buried here. So even if that meant disturbing other burials, that was fine. And we see it in collective burials later where you kind of come in and you make room for the next deposition and then that decomposes and you make room, you push to the side and you put in the other one. And you don't have these kind of like medieval, when you see medieval cemeteries where you kind of like have these kind of like, okay, oh, we take all the bones and we're like, we're gonna put them here and then we put our new deposition in here. No, they kind of dig through it. And we were also interested in looking at the time at like how, how they used the filling of the burials. And it looks like the fillings of some of these burials was really fillings from old, older, uh, uh, older occupation layers. So they're taking really uh, humus rich soil that's full of old, much older artifacts and filling it up. So we're even thinking about uh, extrapolating on like how the path, like how they are engaging with this particular place in the landscape as some, a place where they are aware of the past of the place in a very intentional way and manipulating it. So I don't think that it is that they don't care. I think it's that they, it has become meaningful to them to, uh, and so the disturbance of the older burials is not necessarily a problem. It's, it's, it just means that you're now down there with the rest of the, the past, right? Is, it sort of, um, is, that, is that helpful? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Is it sort of a sort of phenomenon, a rare thing that bones that are like four or five thousand years old are still preserved, or is there something special that happened in those particular sites, or are most bones 
four or five thousand years old, like still there. Like everyone that was yeah. born and died five thousand years ago, are their bones still around? Of course, that's well, especially with the new, like Mesolithic. No, we have like a fragment of everybody that lived and and died, obviously. Uh, and and in terms of preservation, it's what said, like Svinik is fantastic because it's gravel and it's. Uh, uh, um, it's it's full of uh, limestone. Yeah, limestone. Yeah, and so it's perf. It drains beautifully, and then it kind of like preserves the bones beautifully. So those conditions are like fantastic for it. Uh, but you can have places like Finland or something where you have like really acidic soils where you just have like ochre filled features left and barely. But then in the Mesolithic, we always still have this huge problem, like how representative are these sites? Because uh, we, we, we have such a small, uh, we have such a small percentage of, of the population, even in the site like Svenjika where we have the dates, the number of people is not enough, so they must have had either completely other pra practices or other places, and so that obviously remains an issue. And, and there is an emerging, really interesting focus now in Mesolithic research on isolated human bones, on uh, uh, practices of uh, cutting up bodies and burning, and, and all these other uh, completely con that contrast really clearly to especially those sub the material that I showed you today that, we, that we're starting to pay much more attention to and uh, depositions of skulls and stuff like that that we're starting to both find and pay attention to. So this is just, this is just uh, scratching the surface, I think. So that's always a problem. You sort of touched precisely, well, so first of all, really fascinating and interesting stuff that you get out of it, and marvelous science. Yeah, nice. Um, <laughs> but you just uh, actually touched on what I was uh, wondering about, because you mentioned, I think, for the southern Swedish site mm -hmm. that there were, or the dates, I can't remember, that there were a couple of cremations you yeah, there mentioned three. passing. And so, and that made me wonder, is that these are wonderfully preserved, and mm -hmm. those cremations, are those just like later, or are they part of it? There, and yeah. Since and the sort of implication of that would be, well, or might there be implications saying you've been arguing that maintaining the composition and the appearance of the body is normative? Well, so the cremation is the opposite of that. Yep. But, but it's also much more difficult to find. So yeah. are these archaeologically very visible yeah. depositions that attract archaeologists' attention? Yeah. Well, what is the normal? What is the? Yeah. Could I tack on one thing to that? Because yes, are, and if I forget, you yeah, well, remind me. Yes. Um, these, these are all sites that are connected to water. Is that correct? Yes. So, is there a potential there is a distinction between those who are buried on land and those who are deposited in the waters? And we might we have depositions. We have some depositions in water that have been found. There's one in south, southern Denmark that is actually in this, like that has been preserved in the sea. We have these fantastic skulls on stakes that were deposited in a, in, a, in a lake site in middle Sweden with preserved brain matter inside uh, in Tanalbord and Imotala. So, and that's, but I think that's different because they have healed trauma. And I, I don't think that they were. I, I, I think there is a darker story there. But uh, cremation, yes. Th th First of all, in representativity, these are like the classic site where we have been looking for burials by the water, up a little bit on the hill. Okay, so both Skottholm, Vedbeck, and Svenjaker are like that. Uh, there are other Mesolithic sites uh, across the Baltic that, uh, so there's not just these three, I, I, I just haven't studied them so much, but uh, we still have <coughs> uh, similar things, but there are other, there's a site in Poland called Dudka where everything is completely, uh, where everything is po seems to be possible, uh, and it's not fully published yet. So that's going to completely we kind of affect this. But about the representation with regards to cremation, uh, Skotholm has three cremations. In the Vedbeck area, there are a few cremations. Cremation coexists in a with inhumation during the Mesolithic. 
Uh, I would argue that on the one hand we can see inhumation and cremation as radically different, but we can also see that they are similar in the sense that they avoid the decomposition process. Uh, uh, and I think that that's the reason why they coexist in our culture as well. They are comfortably coexisting in our culture. When we say goodbye to, we see this person and then it goes on the, and, but in, the py, in, in a prehistoric pyre would be a way more uh, kind of uh, uh, active engagement than we have today when we just push the button and, and kind of everything goes up in flames. So, but, but I do think that both, what they do have in common is that they both avoid this kind of like decomposition and putrefaction that uh, we see. Could there be a, could there be a, um, could it have to do with when you die during the year? Could it be that uh, mm -hmm. most people are actually cremated and we just don't have them? Or were they, were they, were they just like scattered? I mean, all of these things are completely possible. So my framework applies to what we know right now. And with all of the weaknesses that that entails in prehistoric archeology, span uh, what I think is important though is that it allows us to think through the consequences of the method and theory package and uh, kind of play with what we have in that sense. But you're right. Yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about your use of uh, surveys. And yeah. It seemed kind of semantic, but I think it has broader Yes, I can't wait. So, I mean, you're, you have great evidence showing and affording the, the environment taphonomic process great agency for lack of a better word. So if these processes are agented in affecting the practice of individuals and their purpose of rituals and burial, why is human disturbance, uh, why, why do we have human interaction with uh, or interruption of these burials as disturbance? We don't associate that word with natural processes. Uh, so you mean uh, when we when it's a person that does it, we call it disturbance, and when it's uh, a, uh, a, a, a well, we would still we, we would still call it disturbance as long as it's a living thing, right? I think we also call it disturbance if it's an animal that does it. Uh, but yeah, if we want to become symmetrical archaeologists, then we would uh, definitely say that uh, the wind and the erosion and all of those things also disturb areas and. I think you have a point. Uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, something that I I uh, have thought a lot about, but you do have a point, especially if you would consider this to have been noted in the past. If you uh, think about it as something that the people in the past would have paid attention to and would have thought of, kind of built into their cosmological uh, or ontological uh, creation of the world, then yes, uh, animals and other natural, uh, like wind and erosion and other things, water. I think that it becomes interesting when it's something that, uh, the key is, uh, did it become incorporated into the, I'm really interested in how people then dealt with and conceived of and understood death. So if it's something that they noted and kind of made room for in their understanding, then that's really an interesting thing, I think. I think that's in particular if you think about like sky burials or uh, burials where we know that you have an interaction with uh, that is noted and meaningful by. If you just put it in the ground and don't interact with it anymore, uh, as a person of the past, it maybe it's, nothing might really happen, even though we know that it does. Yeah. What What was your thought process around that question? Okay, I, I think you know it's a very common usage in yeah. archaeology yeah. to just use uh, mm -hmm. disturbance mm -hmm. as human mm -hmm. disturbance, but clearly we're seeing here environmental mm -hmm. factors that are clearly having yeah. some form of disturbance yeah. that humans can otherwise have. Yeah, absolutely. But it is, I never thought about it, but it's interesting that, yeah, but animals too, we, we view them as like the disturber of ours. Yeah, yeah, good point. If there are no other questions, let's talk, uh, thank our speaker one more time.